Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third in our series of One Oncology Precision Medicine Talks. Uh, we've had a great series so far for the last few nights, and we're going to change things up a little bit tonight. We're going to show you what we do on a weekly basis at One Oncology to do what we call our Processing Molecular Tumor Board, which aggregates mm -hmm. all the comprehensive genomic profiles that are generated from our practices on the last week. And they are reviewed and stratified uh, so that the most interesting ones are presented to a group of uh, physicians and experts who will introduce themselves in just a minute. And we go through the clinical case as well as the CGP report and make non-binding recommendations to our physicians about this. Uh, we have found this very effective in terms of getting patients uh, potentially enrolled on clinical trials or at least referred for clinical trials, making sure they get access uh, to the right precision medicines, and in some cases, uh, recommending a different type of therapy. Uh, we, tonight, we have uh, some very interesting cases, and we picked some of the cases we've seen over the last few weeks, which were particularly interesting with some data to share with you. So we have a lot of cases to get through, and we'll get through as many as we can. But without further ado, I want to uh, introduce our panel, uh, and I'll take them as I see them here on my screen. Um, so Lisa, would you start? Hi, I'm Lisa Raff. I'm the Senior Director of Pharmacy and Therapeutics and Pathways for One Oncology. Thank you. Jason? You're on mute, by the way, Jason. Hi, I'm Jason Porter. I'm a medical thoracic oncologist. I'm at the West Cancer Center Research Institute in Memphis, Tennessee. So I'm uh, Harry Staszewski. I'm a medical hematologist, oncologist at New York Cancer and blood specialist and a member of the Precision uh, Committee of One Oncology. Thank you. Ray? Hi, this is Ray Page. I'm the president and director of research at the Center for Cancer and Blood Disorders in Fort Worth, Texas. Dan? Uh, hello, uh, Ben Vaina, medical oncologist. I'm a GU medical oncologist, actually also the director of a phase one program here at the West Kinsta Center in uh, uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, Mary? Hi, I'm Mary Gearing. I'm a senior scientist in medical affairs at Foundation Medicine. And Holly? Hi, I'm Holly Dilks. I'm a senior director and the head of field in the medical affairs division at Foundation Medicine. Thank you all. And I'm Lee Schwartzberg. I'm Chief Medical Officer for One Oncology. And so we have a very uh, excellent panel here. And these are the same people that every week get together and uh, donate their time to go through these cases. So we'll go right into the first case here. Um, and uh, Harry, this is a New York Cancer and Blood case, if you would present, please. Sure. Thank you and welcome everyone. So um, this is a 76-year-old female, is a, a patient of one of our colleagues, Dr. Avento, in the practice. So she had a stage two adenocarcinoma of the colon in 2017. It was decided because um, she didn't have high risk factors that she would not receive any adjuvant therapy at that time. And she was without evident disease until four years later when she developed a painful chest wall mass. And PET scan showed a, a minor um, suspicious mass in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. The chest wall mass was biopsied and the immunohistochemistry was consistent uh, with her original colon um, tumor. So um, she began uh, therapy <clears throat> with Fulfox plus Bevacizumab. She very poorly tolerated the first cycle with a lot of nausea and peripheral neuropathy. She then um, uh, dropped the oxaliplatinum and continued with a 5-FU infusional therapy with the bevacizumab and then suffered with uh, severe diarrheal syndrome, diagnosed with uh, enteritis. She refused any further 5-FU uh, therapy. Uh, at that time, a repeat uh, PET CT scan demonstrated some response in the chest wall mass, the, that um, abdominal right upper quadrant uh, mass had disappeared, um, but she still had a persistent mass and um, discomfort in the chest wall. So I, a genomic profile was ordered at that time. And here are the findings uh, from the Foundation One. Uh, so she had a uh, KRAS uh, G12C mutation, uh, was wild type for NRAS, uh, and she had uh, a two pit 
three CA mutations, as well as uh, an APC, uh, two APC mutations, and a SMED uh, four uh, mutation. So uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Mary and Holly to comment on the G12C uh, specifically. Sure, so um, KRAS G12C, we see most commonly in non-small cell lung cancer. However, it is present in about one to 3% of colorectal cancers. Um, and as you can see here, so Torisib is listed as a therapy with clinical benefit in other tumor type because the um, Sotorisib so G12C uh, specific inhibitor has been approved um, for non small cell lung cancer. And um, the mechanism behind this drug uses that cysteine residue um, for the binding of the inhibitor to uh, the protein. So uh, I'll open it up to the panel for any discussion. Um, I, uh, I'll just make one comment first. You know, Harry, it might be interesting to do DPD um, deficiency or uh, genotyping on her because it kind of sounds like you might be that one out of 100 who has that just for the future. Right. It was, but I, I believe the patient just absolutely refused any chemotherapy yeah. except for bevacizumab, which she had tolerated. So, um, but yes, that's a good point that was um, forwarded to the clinician here. So uh, maybe we can ask, you know, based on these results, would people try a, a different regimen at, at progression, um, a different chemo regimen, or want to try uh, a targeted therapy? So this is the answer. opportunity for Lonsor for regorifamib uh, in this situation. Uh, which, as you know, usually gets marginal responses. You may try that before your G12C drug. Yeah, so so this is the end. So, you know, we commonly see patients like this get referred to our, you know, phase one program also for, you know, colon cancer for multiple lines of therapy. And, you know, further 5-FU-based treatment here may be complicated because of the uh, history of the colitis and so forth. So, so there's two issues here that we commonly talk about. One is the PIK3CA mutations, and that's you know still targeting this investigational in colon cancer. There's ongoing trials uh, now looking at targeting one of them. There's actually ongoing trials targeting uh, uh, patients with with two mutations PIK3CA. Uh, specifically, which mutations they are, I always have to look up on the eligibility, but this, you know, this could be a consideration because there's a double mutation here. Uh, a, a little bit unclear to me if double mutations versus single mutations may, may be something that's more, more pathogenic or more, more actionable. I think the trials will show us that. But, but the other common question is the G12C, like was just mentioned, and it's tantalizing to think about targeting that because of satoracib approval in lung cancer. I think the issue with uh, colon cancer is that the data with the single agent so far has been much less uh, much less promising in colon. So we're still trying to learn exactly, uh, you know, how to use that information. Typically, we have not been recommending using off-label satoracib for colon because the response rates are very slim. Um, uh, the data that's been presented in the latest meeting seems to suggest that the combination with uh, of of those uh, you know G12C inhibitors to best responses in colon seem to be perhaps this is all early data perhaps the best responses seem to be with with cetuximab or panitumumab, which is you know quite interesting because these are the patients that as you see in the foundation uh, report should not be used because of the KRAS mutation. But it turns out that biologically, when you actually inhibit the G12C, you may need the, the cetuximab and the penitumumab to block the feedback loop. And Mary Holly can speak more to the biology of that. But it, it, the suggestion so far is that if you're going to use an inhibitor, that you actually should use cetuximab or penitumumab with that. But again, it's all early data, and the data in colons so far has been less, you know, more, uh, less underwhelming than, or more underwhelming than in lungs. So we would still favor to enroll those patients in a G12C specific trial. And, and, and especially if you have a combination G12C 
plus drug B trial and not uh, G12C inhibitor alone. That, that's been our philosophy here in, in cases like this, in colon cancer cases. So uh, just a couple of comments. Um, and uh, we're really talking to an audience that includes the, the one oncology people. So we can talk about some of the trials that we have. So we do have a basket trial, um, the MyTactic trial, where we do have the ability to enroll patients who have double pic 3 ca mutations. And I believe both of these would be qualified for that. The 545 five or 546 um, uh, codon definitely is, is one. And I believe the 10... Uh, 108 is as well. So that's one option for the patient. And then, like you say, um, the, the colon data, and I'll, I'll show this quickly, and um, Dan already uh, went over this in general. So this is a second, oops. Uh, this is a second drug, uh, a G12C inhibitor called Adagrasib. And this data was from uh, ESMO. Uh, this is looking at single agent response in advanced colorectal cancer for G12C patients. And you can see the response rate was 22%. Um, that seems to be about the same, maybe slightly numerically higher in this very small uh, selected phase two than one would see with sotoracid, but um, at least has at least comparable, maybe a slightly better with stable disease in 64 and clinical benefit in 87%. But just like Dan said, uh, there was a cohort, which was smaller still, with uh, looking at the combination of cetuximab and adagrasib. And you can see here the response rate was 43%, which I think starts to get our um, attention. So um, we're, we're starting to see potentially this uh, paradoxical feedback loop, which uh, stimulates um, uh, EGFR. Uh, so uh, cetuximab seems to, in combination, to be necessary here, as Dan said. And my understanding is that there are studies now ongoing with both sotoracib and panitumumab, as well as adagrasib and cetuximab. So that would be another recommendation for this patient, Harry. I think if we can uh, get them into one of those trials. I think that would be uh, really, really the best. So we recently opened um, one of these trials, uh, but the a clinician, I believe, got sotoracid uh, uh, for the patient. So one of the one of the problems is there's an automatic rejection from the insurance company when you have KRAS mutation for an EGFR antibody. So right. you have to. <laughs> so if you're going to do it out of the context of a clinical trial, you got to work around that uh, detail. Yeah, it just shows you how fast the science moves, and uh, uh, payment does not necessarily follow that. So. This would be a complicated discussion with a peer to peer, I think, but it might be worth it uh, in any case. Um, okay, any other comments on this one? All right, we'll go on to the second case. Dan, if you would present, this is a West Cancer Center case. Sure, so this was, uh, this is actually a 75 year old man uh, who's actually my patient. A history of bladder cancer in 2019 had uh, uh, intravesical BCG before he progressed this year uh, with muscle invasive disease with a large bladder mass, uh, TRBT showed muscle invasion. And on PET CT, there was widespread uh, retroperitoneal pelvic adenopathy. Uh, when I saw him, uh, the PS was ECOG2, had uh, worsened in the last, uh, you know, in, a, in a four weeks uh, up to that point. Uh, he had some uh, AKI, the creatinine was around 2.5 or so from obstruction, nephrostomy tubes were placed. He was actually having quite a bit of pelvic pain and back pain. Uh, so at that time, um, uh, based on his performance status and his renal function, I uh, decided uh, that he was not a first-line chemotherapy candidate that uh, as we can discuss in a little bit, ties into the whole recent changes in the paradigm of how to, to deal with bladder cancer in the first line setting. Uh, but basically, I initiated him on pembrolizumab at that time, and we can talk about the rationale on that. Uh, he actually responded quite nicely. And around the same time, I requested a molecular profile, uh, not only medical profile with the CDX, but also the PDL1 IHC. Um, and um, otherwise, there were no, he had no contraindications for pembrolizumab and was pretty healthy otherwise. 
Okay. So here's the uh, CGP report. Um, so there was an, uh, not high TMB in this case and mac microsatellite no instability. So it was MSI stable. There was uh, both amplification of ERB2 as well as a mutation in ERB2. And uh, there were a variety of, uh, of other um, alterations, including a TP53, as well as amplification of CCND3. So um, maybe uh, we'll ask uh, Mary and or Holly to comment on the amplification. Maybe before we do that, uh, we can talk about how amplified this was. Lisa, uh, deep in the report, there's, uh, I think, some some additional information about that? Correct, so for the ERBB2 alteration, the amplification and the R103Q mutation, the variant allele frequency was 3.6%. Okay. Now that's that's the mutation part, right? That's not the amplification. That's the mutation. Yeah, does it, yeah. It doesn't, does it just it doesn't say amplify? Okay. No, it doesn't break them out. It's just all under one. Yeah, the, the foundation reports typically won't show the level of amplification. And you, I mean, Mary and Holly can talk a little bit about that. I, I think that's harmonized to mean that it's a level that is is significantly amplified, but the reports don't say how much amplification exists on on a report on a on a on a tumor type. And just for the audience, in case uh, you're not aware, the ERB two is another name for her too. So Mary and or Holly, you want to uh, comment on on uh, the coexistence of amplification and a mutation in this setting? Sure. Um, so it's not uncommon for us to see amplification with a co-occurring mutation. Um, this mutation is actually what we call functionally unknown. So it's been described recurrently in cancer, but it hasn't been shown um, directly in a biochemical assay to be activating. Um, however, as you said here, we have the amplification, um, meaning that we have an increased copy number of ERB2, you know, and this has been most well studied in breast cancer, but we do see it recurrently across a number of tumor types, uh, including in urothelial cancers. And so you can see that a variety of um, drugs targeting uh, this gene are listed in the therapies with clinical relevance in other tumor type. Um, we have um, antibodies, inhibitors, and then uh, the newest class of drugs, antibody drug conjugates uh, listed here. So Dan, why did you start the patient on Pembro uh, right away? What was right. the rationale for that? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. So basically, uh, you know, this patient obviously fits the cisplatin ineligible category where for the last two years or so, there's been, uh, you know, quite a significant number of uh, approvals of upfront PD-1 therapy for patients with cisplatin ineligible. Uh, then about a year and a half to two years ago, the evidence from other studies suggested that only patients who are PDL one positive would benefit from that approach. And there was restriction in the label of most of those agents for first line use for PDL one positive. And then later what happened last year was that the data with the Javelin 100 came out with maintenance of Velomab, including patients who got carboplatinum cytobine up front. So, uh, and that was very uh, relevant data. So it again, further detracted from using immunotherapy first. So the current role of immunotherapy first is mostly for patients who are actually not a candidate for chemotherapy at all. So not candidates for cisgem, not candidates for carbogem, which would be what we would do, you know, if, if he had come to my clinic, was a PS1 uh, with the same exact age, was a PS1 and had a creatinine of 1.6, I'd probably have given him carbogem. But at the time I saw him, he actually had a uh, worsening creatinine over time and his performance status was actually declining as well. So I decided he was not a candidate for Carbogem. And so I used, uh, I used the most recent indication for Pembro, which was revi revised just a few months ago, in fact, to say 
that if a patient is not a candidate for chemo at all, then you can still use Pembro. Now, the recognition is that if patients are pdl one negative, the response rates are going to be quite low, and the response rates will be better if you're pdl one positive. It was a little bit of a gamble at that point. I didn't have a lot of time because it was quickly progressing. So I went ahead and started the Pembro at the same time getting the pdl one to kind of as, as you know, over time kind of reassess, is this really going to work or not? Luckily, he was pdl one positive and, and luckily it worked. But so that's, a, that's the aspect about the Pembro. Now, the aspect about the molecular profile is for, important for the audience to know. The main reason why we obtain molecular profile, now I'm not talking about PD-1, I'm talking about the NGS part. Main reason why we get molecular profile in bladder cancer is to look for FGFR mutations, right? Because we have the approved uh, use of FGFR inhibitor with or the fitnib. So that's really the primary reason why we get NGS in the first place. So here, obviously, we saw these initial findings, which opens the door for discussion, and we can talk about the HER2 aspect in a second. But just important to understand, the main reason why we always get a molecular profile in bladder cancer, the primary reason is looking for FGFR mutations. So this is a poor, so, um, so that makes total sense. So what, what would you do, or what would any, uh, the panel do, recommend when, if and when the patient progresses through Pembro, given that he's not a good candidate for chemo and remains that way. You want me to speak again? Yeah, well, uh, let's get other opinions too. <laughs> well, I mean, <clears throat> I found that erdafitinib is a difficult drug for a poor performance uh, status patient to tolerate. So, you know, it would be interesting to pursue the ERB2 option, you know, either on protocol. I don't know if because the performance status improved enough that we could consider that. <clears throat> but, you know, patients, uh, there are arms open with the various basket trials that we've had man or B2 amplification. So he does not even have, he turned out not to have the FGFR mutation. So, I mean, all, all that he has actually seems to be the, the HER2, um, like you just said. So, so one yeah, question, uh, wait, that. excuse me, Dan. So there's a question from the audience, maybe somebody, uh, uh, could talk about how um, we interpret, first of all, how we interpret allele frequency and whether it means anything. So maybe our foundation colleagues would like to comment on that first. I'm happy to answer that. Um, with, with allele frequency, I mean, that's really, you know, kind of giving you, uh, giving you um, a representation of what percent of the, of that allele is present in the, in the um, in the sample um, that we've sequenced, and um, I, you know I think as Dr. Oxnard said the other night um, with the liquid test, it you know no matter what the allele frequency is, if you see an actionable alteration, uh, you can you can know that it's it's there. You have confidence. I think where the question might be coming in is um, if the allele frequency, and I know this was covered the other night as well, if the allele frequency is um, in the range of maybe thirty to fifty percent, then you know there might be questions of whether or not that uh, that allele or that variant is a somatic or germline in origin. And um, one of the one of the things that uh, I'm you know, think is very unique about this tumor board um, generally is we have a genetic counselor who is uh, present uh, weekly with us and, and can talk about um, the, the variants that, you know, might be germline in origin and, and think through kind of the, the ramifications of that. And so, I, you know, I think with allele frequencies, again, uh, looking at the at that and 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 seeing it within um, the range of you know kind of that thirty to fifty percent, you do have to start you know thinking about uh, the potential for for germline origin and and you know various reports depending on which vendors providing will will give uh, various guidance on whether or not those um, variants could be you know germline in origin. Hey, Great, thank you. Um, oh, go ahead, Ray. Yeah, uh, Daniel, I have a question for you. So, so you know, with bladder cancers, oftentimes you, you it's not uncommon to see a, a high tumor mutational burden. Is there ever any point in time where, if you have an exceptional tumor mutational burden, that that would trump uh, PDO one or, or your choice for chemotherapy, where you would sequence things differently with your treatment based on TMB? 
not really. I mean, we, I mean, anti pd one therapy is well established in, in bladder cancer now. You know, either we use it at maintenance of LMAB after initial chemo, or we use it up front just like we're using now, or we use it second line if it's never been used. So at, at any point in time, it's used anyway. So I, I don't think I would trump the sequence based on that. I wouldn't make a, make a change. Now, in this particular case here, uh, you know, what I, you know, one of the established options that is quite effective uh, for next line of therapy is, uh, is uh, Infortumab Bendotin, uh, which initially was approved for a sort of third line after platinum, after IO, and now has an additional accelerated approval for platinum ineligible patients after IO, and it's a very effective drug as well with the high response rate. Um, so uh, what I would probably do in this case upon progression is use Infortumab and then and then the HER2 option would be the third option here. So this is basically what, what comes to the to you know the, the practical implications here. So there's two different aspects of what HER2 in this case. One is the mutation and one is the amplification, right? And so if you look at the combination data from my pathways, an example, trastuzumab, pertuzumab was a basket study, you'll get about 25%. Uh, response rate with uh, trastuzumab, pertuzumab. There's six or seven different anti-HER2 agents being studied in, in bladder cancer as well, not only bladder cancer, multiple tumor types, but this certainly would be a fertile ground for considering an anti-HER2 therapy trial uh, or off-label use uh, of uh, trastuzumab, pertuzumab as an example. The mutation, okay. the mutation is a little bit different. Those uh, those studies have not been out to be to have great results so far. So let me uh, just go quickly to um, the the my tactic trial, which is open, and some of the people uh, from our audience have have referenced this from One Oncology and other sites, which have this uh, very interesting basket trial open. So there are actually several arms which we'll show here for either mutation or amplification without known TMB high. So this patient would qualify. And uh, you know, if, if the performance status remains poor, they could just get fixed dose um, pertuzumab, trastuzumab, which as you said, Dan already has uh, uh, activity noted uh, given intravenously. Or if they were more wanted to be more aggressive, you could give them TDM1 and tucatinib, uh, small molecule TKI. So I think this might be a good option for second or, as you said, third line. I want to move on and get through at least one more case. I knew we were going to go slower than I expected. I have eight, <laughs> eight or nine cases here. We're only going to get through probably about six. But let's go uh, to this case of Ray's. Yeah. Yeah, this is a case from one of my partners at uh, CCB in Fort Worth. And, and in 2016, we had a lady that was 43 years old with a, a diagnosis of, of invasive lobular carcinoma, grade three, ERPR positive, HER2 negative. And she had de novo stage four uh, disease where she had multiple lymph node mats and had peritoneal carcinomatosis and, as well as extensive bone mats uh, that you can see uh, this kind of presentation with lobular. She was originally treated with tamoxifen. She got a couple of cycles of adromycin and cytoxin when she had uh, toxicities that and elected to do alternative therapy for a while. Uh, thereafter, uh, she got placed on abraxane and did well with abraxane for a while. Had some progression in 2019 and was placed on Fazodex and abimeclisib. And then uh, that, that created disease control and, and uh, kept her bone disease uh, quiet for quite some time. Um, this year, uh, she started showing some, some slow progression of disease. And uh, she was placed on everolimus and exemestane. She had some mouth sores from the everolimus, but otherwise uh, did fairly good. But with those, with those changes uh, that occurred uh, a few months ago, uh, GPC, uh, I'm sorry, CGP was sent and tested. Okay. And here's the CGP report. Um, she had an amplification of CCND1 and she had a, uh, a also amplification in FGF3, but FGFR uh, amplification as well. FGF3 is, is a ligand, not the receptor that's found on the surface. And CDH1 had a mutation. Uh, and the others are probably less uh, relevant here. Um, was uh, no biomarker, in other words, no MSI or TMB. So uh, let me um, ask Lisa if you can tell us the uh, variant allele frequency of CDH1 
um because that does have some relevance here potentially pulling it up right now it's, um so the vaf was 69 percent of cdh1 okay so we do know that they're in lobular carcinomas that um, there can be uh there's an association with um cdh1 germline mutations so unfortunately our uh unfortunately our genetic counselor as holly said was unable to make it uh tonight and was pulled away at the last minute but um you know given let me ask uh, uh mary and holly with a 69 percent um vaf and and how does that compare to the others is well the only other one we have actually is arid 1a but um with that 69 percent uh, would that be in the range of what one would see with a germline? And from your perspective, would you recommend germline testing? Yeah, so I think it's important to think of VAF as, again, kind of a guide. Um, you know, the test is a somatic test, so it's not saying whether the variant is germline or not. It's not designed to do that. But as you said, that the VAF can kind of give us a hint as to what's going on. Um, so in this case, I think you definitely would be suspicious, and um, especially if the patient had a family history, uh, you would want to follow up and get germline testing. Um, and CDH1 is also associated with uh, an increased risk of gastric cancer. Right. And so uh, this presentation is really interesting. Now, uh, as a breast medical oncologist, I'm used to seeing lobular carcinoma present with peritoneal disease, and it can be very difficult to detect. In fact, uh, many times the PET scan will be completely negative, and I even have a couple of cases where a patient had to go to surgery for an exploratory laparotomy to find cheat lobular cancer. So lobular cancer in, a, in and of itself is, is always the fooler, and also in, uh, can invade the gastric lining, not infrequently. But the diffuse gastric carcinoma is another uh, component of CDH1 germline mutations, and it could present with the same thing. So I think, uh, although I'm very comfortable with Ray, and uh, you know, you may have other, uh, additional information, but I'm very comfortable that this looks like a characteristic case of lobular cancer. Plus, they responded very well to endocrine therapy, um, and uh, so it makes sense. But still, might be worth looking for family implications for germline testing here. Yeah, uh, this is a very interesting molecular case. Uh, just to give you an, an update, which is kind of sad, both she and her husband uh, got COVID uh, infection, and she did not do well with COVID infection and had a rapid decline and died from, from the, the virus. Oh, that's, yeah, which is, which is that's terrible. What a, yeah, what an impact on everyone we see. Yeah. I will uh, just spend one second about talking about these alterations because it is interesting the co-amplification of um, both fgfr and um, cdh1 is characteristic in breast cancer this is a, a i won't go into in detail but basically it shows that um, you do see uh, very commonly about a third of cases uh, do have fgfr uh, one or two alterations which are a Putative um, resistance mechanism to CD uh, uh, CDK46 inhibitors, and uh, you see here that uh, they they do coexist. This panel here just shows that one way to go over it is to use a FGFR inhibitor, like Dan was talking about, uh, in this case, or, or Datafib plus uh, fulvestrin and palbo. So, in at least in preclinical work that is being tested. And there's a whole bunch of trials. Um, so obviously the update on this patient makes it irrelevant, but there's uh, ertafitinib, palbo, and fulvestrin is being tested, for example, to overcome that resistance. Yeah, so this uh, was a 67-year-old uh, female, still an active smoker with uh, comorbidities of COPD and CHF who presented with a large uh, malignant pleural effusion some sub-centimeter pulmonary nodules, mediastinal mass, which was thought to be a pericardial cyst. So, with that. so the, um, the fluid was tapped, uh, cytologist compatible with uh, pulmonary adenocarcinoma. She had a tumor marker with a CEA of 76 at that point and um, comprehensive genomic profiling was sent. Okay, and here's the CGP. And uh, she has an ERB 
uh, alteration. Uh, this is a liquid test. So this is the first liquid test we've seen um, from foundation. The report looks similar, but you see here that um, it does, uh, in this particular case, list the TMB and the microsatellite um, was not detected. Uh, the tumor fraction cannot be determined, and I'll let Mary and Holly talk about what that means. Uh, and there was an ERB B2 uh, alteration here with a variant of, of allele frequency of 0.7%. In addition, there were several other findings, including a P53 alteration and other findings which uh, may relate to the blood test. On the second page, which is listed here, you see all the variant allele frequencies of uh, each of the aberrations that were found. So maybe you guys can comment on the difference between a tissue and a blood sample and what, and then specifically what we're seeing with the ERB2 here. Sure, so in this case, what we're seeing um, is a, a liquid test and liquid profiling, you know, rather than getting a sample of the tumor directly, what we're getting is the shed from the tumor um, of circulating tumor DNA, but that's not the only source of DNA in blood. We also have DNA from normal cells as well as white blood cells. So um, in order to be able to detect variants in DNA, or sorry, excuse me, in, in um, blood, you have to be sequencing um, in a very sensitive manner. Um, so this test is able to detect these very low frequency findings. Um, and you can see here that the tumor fraction could not be determined. Um, this may be because there was not very much um, tumor DNA in the blood. However, we were still able to find this ERB2 mutation. Um, and this mutation in particular is an exon 20 insertion. You may also be familiar with exon 20 insertions from the EGFR gene. Uh, those are also seen in lung cancer. Um, and so thinking about ERB2 in lung cancer, instead of seeing amplifications as we did in the, um, the previous urothelial case, we actually most commonly see these exon 20 insertions. Um, and you can see looking uh, at the right, um, a fat nib is listed as being approved in the patient's tumor type because it's approved for EGFR uh, alterations in non-small cell lung cancer. And then therapies with clinical relevance in other tumor type, again, we see ERB2 antibodies as well as those antibody drug conjugates. And these um, specific mutations are resistant to lapatinib and you can see the resistance indicated there with the, the red um, italicized text as well as the red X with a circle. Um, and so, ERB2 mutations in um, non-small cell lung cancer are definitely of interest. And um, there was some data presented recently at ESMO um, and then subsequently published uh, in the New England Journal that's uh, very exciting. And I think uh, Lee will go ahead and show that a little later. One question that comes up uh, we have from the audience, uh, Mary, is um, it's still unclear to me the significance of lower levels of allele frequency. If you have a 5% allele frequency, what is the other 95%? Sure. So there are a lot of um, different things that can be contributing. So, um, you know, no matter what kind of sample you give um, and, and analyze, it's not likely to be pure tumor. So in a tissue sample, you know, you would have cancerous cells, but you'd also have uh, the normal tissue cells. And so, you know, any cell that's, that doesn't have that variant, um, you're not going to see it there. So if, you know, 5% of cells have the variant, you'll see an approximately, you know, 5% variant allele frequency. Um, so, you know, some cells, some cells may have the variant, some cells may not. And so we get into the thought of um, clonality, you know, how similar are all the cells in the tumor? And again, in this case with liquid, it's even more complicated because tumor DNA is not the only DNA we have in the blood. Um, so we're also getting, you know, normal DNA and then DNA from, from white blood cells. So it's a question that doesn't necessarily have a simple answer, um, but as Holly said, um, you know, when we see a result on, um, 
on a test like this, we are confident that it is a, um, a real result. Thank you. Jason, uh, you're a specialist in lung cancer. How would you approach this patient? You know, I, I was looking there on the first slide and I saw that the plan was to consider starting a fatinib. And I've used a fatinib in these patients. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that, that you all have used a fatinib. It's, it's, it can be pretty rough to tolerate. And um, the diarrhea was actually prohibitive for my patient. And she ended up um, hospitalized not once, but twice with dehydration from the diarrhea. We dose reduced. And in a clinical trial, there was a phase two trial um, um, several years ago um, with the afatinib and the um, ERBB2 positive non-small cell lung cancer. They dose reduced down to as low as 20 milligrams, so half the dose and saw similar efficacy. So um, I continued my patient on just 20 milligrams and she tolerated that okay. Um, I brought her in probably about once every other week for IV fluids and just to make sure that she was doing okay with diarrhea. But the side effects from the afatinib could be an issue. And so we see trastuzumab deruxtecan listed here as an option in other tumor types. Um, and we know that it's been recently approved in, in some other tumor types, but it's actually um, probably a little bit more well tolerated. I know it's got some side effects. We think about things like interstitial lung disease with the trastuzumab deruxtecan. But I think that probably um, as far as the diarrhea and the afatinib goes, it can actually be an issue. So um, if I could get the deruxtecan, I may actually look to start with that and then come back to the TKI if, um, if the patient progressed or did not tolerate the trastuzumab deruxtecan. That would be the way I approached it. Harry, do you know if uh, that was tried and uh, wasn't successful or no, no clinical trials available? Um, well, I don't think uh, for first line that would be eligible for uh, my tactic. Um, right. But the, I think the plan was to obtain the uh, fatinib on this patient initially. She wasn't considered a candidate for chemo either. Okay. And just to uh, highlight what Mary said about, uh, and, and Jason, about uh, TDXD or trastuzumab deruxtecan, this is the data that was uh, just published in the New England Journal a couple of months ago with an overall response rate of 55% in uh, patients who had a HER2 mutation, of which the large majority of them were an alteration in uh, the exon 20 uh, kinase domain, as you see here. Although there were a few that had in the extracellular domain as well. So, um, and you can see on the bottom that some of these patients, uh, if you see actually in this line here, you'll see that there was previous TKI exposure in these patients. So. That doesn't make the, seem to make the patient resistant um, any more so than if they've not had a TKI therapy. So we could certainly reserve this for second line if we can get it, uh, but you know, might be interesting on a clinical trial to do that. And the durations of response were quite long, as you see there. So um, I think we'll go on um, to the next case. I'm going to present this case for, uh, for Dr. Seni Varatni, who is on vacation. This is a case from our Los Angeles Cancer Network. Uh, it's a patient with breast cancer who uh, patient presented with triple positive breast cancer in 2010, got TCH and then uh, urofirceptin, and then was placed on a non-steroidal AI. She progressed with 2014 with bone metastases. At that time, she lost some of her PR, but was still HER2 positive and ER positive. And she received first-line paclitaxel trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and then continued on pertuzumab and trastuzumab and actually had fulvestrin added. She did well for five years with that therapy and then progressed in lung and adrenal gland, was switched to second line TDM1 as per the standard of care. Um, within a year, she had enlarging lung, lung lesions and she actually got TDXD, trastuzumab, deruxtecan, but got, as Jason mentioned, the ILD, the most, the most uh, serious of the uh, toxicities, and hers was serious enough to discontinue the TDXD. She was placed on ribocyclob and fulvestrin, and then had a um, new liver lesion in July of this year. Biopsy showed still ER positive, PR negative, but now HER2 negative, and, um, which is interesting and something we see occasionally loss of HER2 over time. She started capecitabine, had poor tolerance, and then she had a CGP done. And uh, she has uh, two interesting findings uh, here, a, a PIK3CA mutation, 10, uh, 
1047R, which is one of the canonical mutations. And she also has a high tumor mutational burden. She, uh, she has additional uh, interesting findings of BRCA2 and a reversion uh, alteration in BRCA2 as well. So a lot of interesting things going on here. Her TMB was 19. Um, so let me open it to the panel. Um, any discussion on uh, next steps for her, what people would think about this? Ray, what do you think? What'd you do? I don't know. I think uh, there's a possibility of uh, considering targeted therapy. Okay. Anyone else? I, I, my thought is yes. I think there's two options here. Um, I mean, one, uh, there's a lot of questions on what to do, but to summarize the case, you know, relatively quickly. She could. She had a very long response, and whether that was to the anti-HER2 therapy or to the endocrine therapy, we don't know. Um, it could be both, most likely. So one option for her would be um, to go on apelacib and uh, fulvestrin or a non-steroidal AI, since she's been on fulvestrin for quite some time. So you might go back uh, to a non-steroidal AI or steroidal AI, actually. Exemestane would be it would probably be the best choice for her plus uh, a palisade and um, and uh, and and target the pic 3 ca mutation. The other thing which I think I would probably try first is because of her high TMB and this is very controversial in breast cancer because there's not a lot of cases of uh, in the original TMB approval which was agnostic to, to the cancer type of breast cancer but I'll just show you one um, example. This was from the study, which was conducted by ASCO, looking at uh, pembrolizumab, and it was published a few months ago uh, in metastatic breast cancer. So you see here, the response rate is not tremendous, but it is 21% in very late line patients. And they did tend to stay on therapy long if they were either responders or stable disease, as you see here. So another end, it's relatively non-toxic, as everyone knows. So uh, I think uh, either Pembro or a combination of apelacib and endocrine therapy would both be good choices for this patient and uh, could spare her chemotherapy. She couldn't even tolerate a uh, capecitabine right now, and she's uh, previously had ILD. So um, th there are some concerns there. So up until now, there wasn't that much data on giving... Uh, it, um these uh, drugs with uh, her, her two positive patients, the CDK inhibitors? Right, and there still isn't. So that's not standard of care. Um, there is, uh, there's, there's at least a couple of trials that have looked at um, adding a CDK46 to HER2 therapy, and there does seem to be some enhanced activity there, uh, but it's not the standard of care yet. So I agree completely uh, with that, that that wouldn't be uh, typically done. In, uh, in a pathway compliant process right now. Now, again, what to do with these patients that lose HER2, especially a patient like this that over 10 years uh, uh, from diagnosis and seven years with metastatic disease, very possible that a uh, HER2 negative clone is now the dominant clone. In general, we tend to continue HER2 therapy in these patients because we don't know if there's heterogeneity and there may be some sites of disease that remain HER2 positive. This is a complicated issue. A, a, a liquid biopsy might be interesting here to see if there's any signal of uh, HER2 amplification in the liquid biopsy because that aggregates, as was said, the shedding from multiple tumor sites. So you get a better feel, at least I believe, that we, we tend to get a little better feel for what's happening at multiple sites and when heterogeneity is a possibility it may help you make a decision for that. Lee, the other issue in this case is how common is it to see a BRCA reversal mutation right uh, at the beginning like this before the patient had any PARP inhibitor therapy before and what implications does that have for any PARP inhibition later? Yeah, I've only seen it as a one of the resistant mechanisms for patients who have been treated with PARP. So that's a really interesting aspect of this case as well. Um, I wonder if Mary or Holly have any comments on that. 
Yeah, I would agree with you. We commonly see it after exposure to PARP or sometimes also after exposure to platinum. Um, if you could go back to the case report, um, I just know that uh, people may not as be, or sorry, the, the report from um, no, the CGP. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this reversion is taking a frame shift S1848 uh, frame shift 15 and reverting it using a, a frame correcting deletion. Um, and so the idea is that you're restoring some level of BRCA function. And so this patient would not be thought to be sensitive to PARP inhibitors uh, with this molecular profile. And we commonly see these alterations um, after treatment in prostate or breast or ovarian cancers. Um, and they're also detected very efficiently on liquid tests. We often see really uh, heterogeneous um, mechanisms of, um, of reversion resistance to these therapies. So liquid would also be useful here to see if we were seeing that as, as a consequence of uh, a an event that occurred in the lit new liver lesion or uh, and whether or not it shed, and we'll see that as well. So it might give us some more information as well. Okay, let's do one more case. Uh, and uh, if everyone can bear with me for a few more minutes, and this is a case from New York Cancer and Blood. Harry, if you don't mind. Sure, this 77 year old homeless man presented with profound weight loss, urinary retention. He had a huge uh, mass on uh, CT scan in the pelvis. Uh, it seemed to arise from a large heterogeneous uh, prostate with extension to the pelvic sidewall and in little nodes. He basically had bulky lymphadenopathy in the abdomen and pelvis. Uh, he had been a very heavy smoker. He didn't really know any family history. His PSA was actually only 11.8 and um, he had no other evidence of metastasis on CT chest and bone scan, but he had a lot of metastasis visible on PET scan, um, nothing in the brain, and the CT guided biopsy was consistent with a neuroendocrine small cell carcinoma arising from the prostate. And he started treatment with carbovitopicide and the TISO. Okay, and he had a liquid biopsy, and uh, he has some interesting findings, and NTRAC, FMO1 non-canonical fusion uh, and NF1 uh, frame shift alteration and an STK11 alteration, as well as some uh, findings that go along with um, hematopoiesis, uh, clonal hematopoiesis. So um, let me open it to, oh, actually, maybe I'll ask, uh, Mary and Holly to comment on this non-canonical NTRAC mutation, what that means. Sure, so when we think about fusions, what we usually see is uh, the kinase domain of, of the kinase that's fused to a partner gene. And so in this case, it would be FMO1 and TRAC1 would be that fusion we'd be looking for. Um, and so the non-canonical here refers to the event that was detected on the test. So rather than detecting that um, intact fusion with the kinase domain, we actually detected the reverse. So the first half of the gene fused to FMO1. Um, and so what this means is that um, it's possible that there is a fusion, an, an oncogenic fusion, but we don't have enough evidence to say that there is, we just have a suspicion. And so in this case, um, orthogonal testing using another method would be appropriate here in order to try to understand if this is um, a targetable fusion or not. So one can use immunohistochemistry or FISH. Would, would FISH pick this up? In general, I believe um, you can you can use fish to detect NTRAC fusions. Uh, there is also the possibility of using RNA sequencing as well. Yeah, and I think the interesting thing with this one is this was a liquid test, and um, you know you see the tumor fractions at forty five percent. Yet, um, you know these these this allele for this NTRAC. Um, non-canonical fusion is very low. And so, you know, kind of with some of the other conversation that we've had about liquid assays, um, just the limit of detection, um, you know, for, for this, this is at such a low level that, you know, we were able to pick up the non-canonical fusion 
perhaps even a tissue-based um, assay, DNA-based, um, would pick up the, the canonical fusion. I'm um, just, you know, again, this is at such a low, low level of shedding DNA. It's one of the reasons why, you know, we, we probably, uh, the assay did not pick up the, the canonical. And so that would be another orthogonal test as well, the, tish, the tissue-based assay. And have you seen um, NTRAC in, in prostate or at least in the data in terms of uh, how common that is? I think it's very no, it's rare. Not common. Yeah, yeah. This, this, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Was it for me? I think it, it exists, but it's very rare. Now, this is a small cell case, so uh, yeah, I think you see it very rarely, but uh, I haven't personally seen it in my patients, but I think they exist occasionally. Is there data adding um, a checkpoint inhibitor in small cell of the prostate? Oh, that's evolving. I think uh, there's some trials uh, from the COP2 groups that are being planned, but uh, there's there's no no trials to my knowledge on on that on that question. So I you know, often see initial uh, presentation with small cell frequently evolves after initial hormonal therapy for these patients. Um, so, uh, so I, I still, so less, I mean, it's more often that you see a small cell evolving after hormonal treatment for uh, prostate cancer. This, you know, de novo presentation hopefully would be more sensitive to chemotherapy, which I still think even if the N-track was confirmed on the tissue biopsy, you'd still would start with chemotherapy in this case. Correct. Right. I agree with you. I, I mean, especially in this case that we don't even know if it's truly pathogenic or canonical, I, I definitely agree with you. But yeah, I would... Uh, uh, start with uh, platinum-based uh, chemotherapy first and save this for later. But, okay, you know, so is, go this ahead. This highlights very well how, you know, little less clinicians understand about the molecular, you know, molecular biology of all these tests and how it, we need people like Holly and Mary to help us understand those things. Yes, we're very glad they're here to, to help us. And uh, of course, we picked cases that were uh, particularly complex, but uh, we, we get these cases every week. And I think the value of a tumor board like this, um, whether you have uh, a molecular expert at your uh, beck and call on a regular basis, you certainly can get in touch with uh, an expert at any of the labs that you do testing with. They all offer that service. And if you have a difficult case, I would encourage everyone um, to make sure you understand what, what the molecular alteration is. Um, there are many now that we have that we're comfortable with, uh, but there are, as we do these large panels, increasingly in advanced cancer patients, with one oncology, we advocate for all uh, advanced cancer patients at the diagnosis of disease. You come up with more and more of these complicated findings, and it's really worth talking uh, either you know to us, if you're part of one oncology, or if you're part of another institution um, to make sure you're talking to uh, someone who can help you interpret it. So I wanna thank everyone for uh, the time, the panel, uh, for a great discussion of these really interesting cases. I wanna thank our sponsors for allowing us to do this. And I wanna thank the audience uh, for your participation and your excellent questions. And I think with that, we'll uh, say good night and uh, hope you have a great rest of the evening. Bye everyone.